How to Sew a Christmas Stained Glass Window Available in three beautiful prints ready for Christmas this year. Make this stunning stained glass effect window using easy quilting for a three-dimensional finish. Preparing the fabric. Take the stained glass panel that you're going to use and trim it to one inch outside of the outer printed line all the way round. It's easier to trim it a little bit bigger and quilt it and then we'll cut it later. Then you need to cut the backing fabric. I've used a cotton fabric and I've used black so that the quilting lines don't show through. You need to cut the backing piece, then three strips for the binding, and five strips for the hanging tabs. All the measurements for these pieces are given in your instruction booklet, so just follow those and cut out the pieces. You now need to put wadding on the back of your stained glass panel. You can use a fusible wadding like I've done. So place the panel right sides up onto the glue side of the wadding and press it into place. If you're not using a fusible wadding, then just tack it into place or you can spray baste it or just pin it, it's entirely up to you. So make sure you place it centrally on the wadding so you can see that the wadding is cut bigger than the panel. Then take your piece of backing fabric and place that right sides down and place it on top of the wadding. So the backing fabric needs to go right sides up on top of the wadding or you place it right sides down and put the wadding on the wrong side. But just make sure that it's right sides up. And then smooth it into place. Now you can either fix this backing fabric into place by spray basting it. Remember to spray the wadding and not the fabric or you can tack it into place, or you can pin it into place, it's entirely up to you. If you pin it into place, just pin it into place round the edges and then you can place a few pins across. Then what I've done is I've pinned it round the edge just to hold it securely in place. So you can see now that the backing fabric and the wadding is bigger than the panel at the front, just to make it easier for quilting. And this will all be trimmed off later. Quilting the design. You'll see the panel has wide lead lines. These are spaced two and a half millimetres apart, which have been designed to use a two and a half mil spaced twin needle. In the instructions, I explain how to do the quilting and how to work with a twin needle. But this is, I'm going to show you here how to do it. So once you've threaded up your machine following your manual, then stitch alongside the lead lines, the thicker ones. The twin need each needle will go either side of the line, so stitch slowly and carefully to make sure that the needles go either side of the line, and this will create the stained glass effect. Because the needles are both threaded with black cotton, it's really easy to make sure that the lines are absolutely parallel. It's a neater and quicker way of stitching either side of a line. Obviously, you can use just a single needle. You could stitch through the centre of the lines, or you could stitch either side. But using a twin needle makes the stained glass effect much easier and much quicker. To start with, it takes a bit of practice to be able to stitch either side of the line, but after a while, you get really good at it and you can get quite fast. Just keep an eye on the needles to make sure they go on either side of the line. When you get to the end, you can just stitch over the end of the design because that will be cut off later. Now, there's a few things with a twin needle that are different to working with a single needle. So you can see here, there's my parallel space lines. I'm going to do the next line here and I'm going to show you how to turn a corner. You can't turn a corner as you would normally do with a single needle by pivoting because the needles won't go round a corner. So what you do is stitch to the end of the corner and then reverse stitch one or two stitches so that you're at the beginning of the corner. Then raise the twin needle so they're just out of the fabric, lift the presser foot Turn the fabric very carefully. You don't want to move it too much or you'll have long threads. And put the needles back down at the top of the corner like this, into the fabric, and then lower the presser foot. You can now carry on stitching around the corner. And this is a really nice and easy way to go around a corner so that you don't have to keep stopping and starting. And then just continue stitching all the way down that line. When you want to finish a thread, you can either use the lock stitch on your machine or you can reverse stitch. So I'm getting to a quite a pointed corner here. So I'm stitching to the end of the corner, 
then reverse stitching one or two stitches, raise the needles and then very carefully move the fabric because you don't want to leave too long of threads on the top. And then lower the needles again at the top of the line. If you lift the presser foot a bit, you can just see where you need to lower the needles. So they're at the top of the line, lower the presser foot and you can continue stitching. So this line is slightly curved. When you're working curved lines, just work a little bit slowly, more carefully, so that you stay either side of the line. If you don't get it perfect and accurate, it really doesn't matter. You won't notice too much, but that's how you work a curve. Just do it slowly. The twin needles will go round curves as long as they're not too tight. And there we are, I've just reverse stitched to secure the thread, and that's my curved line stitch. So you can see here how I've turned that corner and that I've just gone around the edge by raising the needles and put them back. Now there is another way to do this that I found works just as well and this means that you don't have to be as careful about getting loose threads. So with this one I'm stitching around a curve. Again just move the, the fabric gently. If you find the curve is a little bit tight raise the presser foot with the needle down, needles down in the fabric, move the fabric round slightly and that will help you to get round tighter curves. Just like this. And then again I'm reverse stitching to finish but you can lock stitch as well if you have that function on your machine. So you can see here those are the the, le the lines have now got the parallel lines of stitching. So the other method I was talking about, about turning around a corner, is I'm just starting here. Now what you can do, when you get to the corner, again stitch to the end of the corner and keep the needles down in the fabric and then reverse stitch just one or two stitches. Now if you keep the needles down, you can turn the fabric, do it very carefully so you don't break the needles and then raise them and move them to the beginning of the line. By doing this, it means that you don't get any long threads and it's a little bit quicker. The only thing to bear in mind is that you really do need to move the fabric very gently because obviously otherwise there's too much pressure on the needles and you could break them. But I found this an easier method to do when I was doing a lot of corners. So you can see here, I'm just moving it very gradually. Move the fabric, the needles are down Lift the presser foot so I'm now going around a tighter curve and go back to the down to the next corner. Sometimes you just need to move one stitch at a time. So let reverse one stitch. You depends on the length of your stitch whether you need to reverse one or two stitches, but basically you need to reverse to the end of the line. Lift the needles, lower them back in at the top of the line, and then you can continue stitching. Have a go at both methods and see which one you prefer. Now I'm going to stitch down here. If you're doing lots of very tight corners, it's easier to keep them down. But if you're worried about breaking the needles, then do take them out of the fabric before you turn the fabric. So I'm just going to turn one more corner. You see I've reversed one stitch, left the needles down, lift them up, put them back in at the top of the corner, Lower the presser foot. You could practice this on some spare fabric first before you commit to stitching your stained glass panel. But there's a lot of lead lines on all of the panels, so you'll soon become quite good at it and you'll find your own method that works best for you. So quilt along all the thicker lead lines. You'll find that on your stained glass window there are some thick lead lines. There are also some thinner ones. Now you can quilt along those if you want, but I would use just a single needle. So for this section, I've decided because it's just a tighter curve and it's slightly thinner lines, I'm just using an ordinary single needle. So there's no special method for this. Just when you get to tight curves, obviously lift the presser foot, pivot with the needle down in the fabric and work down. So this is the method that you use if you don't want to use a twin needle. You can either stitch outside, just on the edge of the line like I'm doing here, or through the centre. For the stained glass panels, I quilted 
only around the thicker lines. But you'll find with the thinner ones, you can quilt along those. Do as much or as little as you want. The more quilting you do, the more definition you'll get. But it's entirely up to you. It's your window, so quilt it how you prefer. So you see here that I'm raising the presser foot, just doing one stitch and raising again. And that's how you get around the really tight corners, even with a single needle. So obviously... It's quicker and easier using a single needle, but you do get a lovely effect by using the twin needle. And it's a great opportunity to use one if you haven't before. Your sewing machine manual will tell you how to use and thread up using a twin needle. So read that before you start. So you can see now how I've quilted around the edge using the single needle. Don't worry if you miss the lines a bit like I have. It really won't stand up. It just adds up a bit extra detail. Now, when you've finished all the quilting, you need to stitch using a single needle along the inner edge of the outer line. So you'll see that the outer line on all the panels is two and a half mil thick, but you need to stitch along the inner line just because of the cutting and the binding later. So stitch all the way around, making sure that your needle stays on the inner line. And this secures the edge of the stitching, which makes binding easier. So I've stitched all the way around and now I'm going to trim it. You need to trim through all three layers of the panel, the wadding and the backing fabric, backing fabric quarter of an inch outside the stitched line. So not the outer line, but the line that you've actually stitched. Trim it a quarter of an inch outside. Now, the easiest way to do this is with a rotary cutter and a ruler because you can just place the quarter of an inch mark on your ruler along the stitched line. If you don't have a rotary cutter and ruler, don't worry, you can just measure it. I would make small marks in pencil or an erasable pen a quarter of an inch outside and then just trim along it. This just means that when you bind it, you won't have, you won't have all of the design or any of the design in the outside. So trim the fabric all the way around the edge and then it will look like this. So it's all quilted. As you can see, I've stitched along the inner part of the outer line and I've trimmed it a quarter of an inch side and you finish quilting your panel. Adding the hanging tabs. This is optional and I've done this if you want to hang it up from a rod or a pole. But if you don't want to, just leave this out. Fold one hanging tab fabric piece in half and then stitch it together down the length. Just like this. Then tack together across one end because I'm going to use a turning tube to turn it right sides out. You don't have to use a turning tube and then if you don't, you don't need to do the tacking. But I just find it quicker. Turn it right sides out and then remove those tacking stitches. And that creates a tube for the tab. So open it out. Remove any of the stitches. Pull out the loose threads of any of the stitches. And then refold the tab so that the seam runs down the centre of the back. And press it. Then top stitch along the top edge. And then top stitch along the bottom edge. It just holds it together and looks neater. And then repeat that with all of the five hanging tab pieces of fabric to make five in total. Now take one of the tabs, fold it in half so that the short raw edges meet and pin it together. And then tack it together across the top to create a loop. And then repeat that with all of them so you've now got five hanging tab loops. Now take your quilted hanging and at the top edge, turn it over to the backing fabric side. And on the top edge, this is where you're going to attach them. So they're attached to the top of the back. Measure one inch in from the left hand raw side, the raw edge that you've cut. And mark that with a pin. Then take one of the loops and place the left hand side by that pin. And the short edges at the top need to be level with the raw edge of the quilt so that all those raw edges are matching and it's one inch in from the left. Pin it at the top and then pin it into place at the bottom, making sure it's straight. Then measure one inch in from the right hand side and place a pin in this position. 
and take another of your hanging tab loops and place the right hand side by that pin, making sure the raw edges of the hanging tab loop and the top of the hanging all match up, pin it into place and again pin it into place at the bottom making sure it's straight and you'll keep these pins in at the bottom during assembly to keep the hanging tab loop straight. Then place the other three evenly spaced across the hanging. Do measure this to make sure. So I can you see I've pinned them all in here. I have measured. It's about four inches between each tab. But do make sure that you measure yours to make sure it's accurate because it'll look neater if they're spaced evenly. And once you've got you've done that, tack them into place across the top. And there you can see the hanging tab loops are in at the top. Keep the pins in below because that will just keep it hanging straight during assembly later. Binding the quilt. Take two of the binding strips and place them right sides facing at right angles, matching up the top and side raw edges like this. And then pin them together at the top corner and at the top right corner, the bottom left corner. Now sew them together from the top left to the bottom right corner. You can draw a line if you want to or just sew along it, just like this. Then trim the seam allowance to about a quarter of an inch just to remove the bulk. And then open up the two strips and press the seams open. You've now joined them diagonally, which reduces bulk when you're joining the quilt and also is less obvious. So that when you put the whole binding around the quilt, you won't see it. Join the other binding strip to one end of the two that are joined in exactly the same way and then you will have one long binding strip. Now take your finished hanging and fold it in half to find the centre of one side. <clears throat> you can start and finish wherever you like with the binding, but I like to start in the centre of one side. Mark that centre mark with a pin on the wrong side, so on the backing fabric side. Now take your binding strip. Now I folded mine in half with wrong sides together first and pressed it because that press crease will lie on the edge later. But open it up and place it right sides facing on top of the backing of the quilt. Pin it into place so the short end matches that marking pin, which is the centre. You can remove that now. And then pin it into place matching the raw edge of the binding strip, making sure it's unfolded with the back of the quilt. And the reason we're binding it this way is that you will then fold it over to the front and top stitch it later. Now measure four inches down from the short edge of the binding strip and mark that with a pin. And this is where you're going to start stitching because you need that four inches to help you join the binding strip together later. So it's always best to start about four inches down from the top. Then pin the binding strip into place. Again, remember you're matching raw edges all the way down and pin it down to the bottom of the hanging, right down to the bottom corner. Now measure quarter of an inch in from that corner of the quilt and just place a pin. Just place that pin vertically so it's quarter of an inch up from the bottom of the quilt. And that's where you're going to stop stitching. So start stitching at that pin that's four inches down from the top. Stitch all the way along. When you get to the pin, pivot with your needle in the fabric and stitch diagonally into the corner. And then it will look like this. And this is how to create a mounted corner. Fold the, corn, the strip upwards so that the long edge is parallel with the bottom of the hanging. And then just you finger press or you can press with an iron into place and just pin it right on the edge. Then fold the binding strip back down so it's still right sides facing and the fold of the binding strip lines up with the top edge of the quilt and then pin it into place all the way down that side. Now sew it in place starting from the top all the way down the side and again stop stitching quarter of an inch before the edge and stitch diagonally into the corner. Repeat this process to sew and fold and mitre each of the corners in the same way all the way around the edge of the quilt and then join the short ends using your preferred method you can either overlap them you can sew them diagonally it's entirely up to you on the amber makes website i have a complete tutorial about how to bind a quilt which you can download to for free that explains the whole mitering and joining in more detail now turn the wall hanging over to the right side and fold 
the strip over. Because you press that fold earlier, this makes it a lot easier because the fold is there. So just make sure you fold it over to the front and then repress it because it's come a little bit unfolded when you were doing sewing it on. So make sure that that fold that you pressed earlier lies right on the edge and then just press it all the way around. When you get to the corners, fold them upwards into a triangle like this and press and then fold it back down. So now you've got a nice mitered triangular corner on the, on the corner on the right side. Then once you've done that all the way around, fold the raw edge of the binding strip under so that it just covers that line of machine stitching, the one that you worked around the edge of the quilt just after you'd quilted it. So you can just judge this by eye, fold it under, because you've got that crease that you've pressed earlier, that will sit on the edge. So just, I usually fold it, press it, so it covers the line of stitching, and then pin it. So just work slowly around the quilt. When you get to a corner, pin up to one side, and then pin the other side. If you pin close to the corners before you deal with the corner it's a lot easier then with the corner just fold it upwards like this and fold it downwards and that will create that nice angled corner and you get a really nice neat mitered corner on the front as well as the back of the quilt in this way then continue pressing folding pressing and pinning the binding strip all the way around and then top stitch into place from the right side close to that folded under edge the hanging strips are still facing downwards, so make sure they stay facing downwards, but you've pinned them in the place so they won't get caught. Then it will look like this. So you can see I've top stitched into place all the way around the edge of the quilt, so it's really neat. Because I've worked from the right side, it looks neater than if you'd worked from the wrong side. Now with the hanging loops, you need to unpin them and fold them so they are facing upwards. Make sure they're straight and pin them into place. Now you can either machine stitch across the top or you can hand stitch. I prefer to hand stitch, it's a little bit neater. To do that, use a matching thread and attach, push your needle through the edge of the hanging loop and work two or three stitches on top of each other just to secure the thread so it doesn't come along. And then slip stitch the hanging loop to the top folded over edge of the binding all the way along. You're just using small stitches so just work your stitch into the hanging loop and into the very top edge of that binding. If you want to top stitch, just stitch across the top of them. But I like to use a slip stitch for this because it's less obvious. I think it just gives a neater finish, but it doesn't matter really either way. Obviously, if you're not using hanging loops, you won't need to do this. You might be using your hanging to hang in a different way or you might be using it for another purpose. But if you're doing the hanging loops, then do it this way. Once you've sewn across the front, turn it over and just to make sure that the front and back of the hanging loop has stayed together, just work so a small back stitch through both layers of the hanging loop and into the binding. But do make sure that these stitches can't be seen from the front. You just want them to go into the binding at the back. This just makes sure that the hanging loop stays together. And then once you get to the end, work two or three stitches on top of each other just to secure the thread. And then it will look like this. And there's your hanging loop stitched neatly into place for you to put your dowel or your rod or your curtain pole through. Repeat that with all the hanging loops so they face upwards and slip stitch or top stitch them into place. Now your hanging is finished. So all the hanging loops are stitched into place. It's very neatly bound around the edge. It's all quilted and it's ready to hang on a pole to decorate your home this Christmas.